When we talk about pyrimidine synthesis, there are two different pathways we can utilize to synthesize pyrimidines. There's the salvage pathway and there is the de novo pathway. Here we are focusing on the de novo pathway. So first of all, what is a pyrimidine? A pyrimidine is actually a single ring structure. So in biochemistry and biology, there are pyrimidines and purines. Purines are uh, two ring structures, whereas pyrimidines are one ring structures, and they're found in DNA and RNA. Specifically, pyrimidines include uracil, thymine, and cytosine, where uracil is found in RNA and thymine is found in DNA, and cytosine is found in both RNA and DNA. Here, first, we're going to focus on, focus on the synthesis of UMP, UDP, and UTP. What do these abbreviations mean? U stands for uracil, P stands for phosphate, and the letter in the middle tells us how many phosphates we have. So here we have uracil monophosphate, uracil diphosphate, uracil triphosphate. So here we're focusing on the pyrimidine uracil, and then later we'll see how we can utilize uracil monophosphate to create uh, the cytosine monophosphates and the thiamine monophosphates, the other pyrimidines. So how does this reaction start? Well, we start off with a bicarbonate. How do we form bicarbonate? Bicarbonate is the combination of carbon dioxide and water. But there's a problem. Bicarbonate is a low energy molecule. So it's not very reactive and we need to make it reactive in order for this reaction to proceed. How do we do that? We take the terminal phosphate on ATP and we add it to the bicarbonate. When we do that, since we remove one of the phosphates on ATP, we're going to be left with ADP. And we can see from bicarbonate, we go to carboxyphosphate, which is essentially the phosphate added to the bicarbonate. This reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme known as carbamoyl phosphate synthetase 2. We, you may recognize this enzyme, carb, carbamoyl phosphate synthetase, because it's also present in the urea cycle. But it's important to note that this is carbamoyl phosphate synthetase 2, whereas the one in the urea cycle is carbamoyl phosphate synthetase 1. So all of these first part of the reaction is going to be catalyzed by this enzyme. <clears throat> so once we've added that terminal phosphate onto the bicarbonate, we get this more reactive carboxyphosphate. Now, in this more reactive carboxyphosphate, this phosphate group can act as a good leaving group. We can see over here that's actually going to leave, and it's going to allow for the binding of this ammonia. And we can see this ammonia will bind over here, and we get carbamic acid. But the question is, where do we get this ammonia from? This ammonia is going to be coming from glutamine, because remember, glutamine act is a molecule that acts as a temporary storage unit for this for excess ammonia uh, molecules. So uh, when this glutamine donates that amino group, once it releases that amino group, it gets converted into glutamate. Because remember, the only difference between glutamine and glutamate is that glutamine has that extra nitrogen, whereas glutamate does not. So glutamine donates its amino group the amino group gets added to our carboxyphosphate intermediate where the phosphate is going to leave and the ammonia is going to replace it. Now we have this carbamic acid. Now next we use another ATP and we take that terminal uh, phosphate on the ATP and we add it to the oxygen over here. So since we've removed a phosphate, we're going to be left with ADP and the resulting molecule is known as carbamoyl phosphate. So if we take a look at this molecule, this came from the bicarbonate, this part came from the uh, ammonia and glutamine, uh, uh, the, the nitrogen and glutamine, and this part comes from that last ATP that we used. So we used two ATPs, but one of the phosphates was released, one of the phosphates remains, but we're going to lose this phosphate in the next step. The reason why we add these phosphates we want is because we want to create a more high energy molecule, a good leaving group that will allow for another substrate or molecule to replace it. And that's exactly what we see over here. 
this phosphate is going to act as a good leaving group and we're going to see that aspartate is going to come in and it's going to bind to this carbon. Aspartate is an amino acid. That's really important to note over here because when we talk about the de novo pathway of synthesizing pyrimidines, in the de novo pathway, we use amino acids. And so far, we've actually used two amino acids. We've used glutamine to donate that nitrogen, and we, we're, now we're using aspartate. And we'll see the fact from our aspartate, we get that second nitrogen. Now, what happens is that, um, as I said, the phosphate will leave, and aspartate will bind. This is catalyzed by aspartate transcarbamoylase, and we're going to go from carbamoyl phosphate to carbamoyl aspartate. But let's quickly review the structure of aspartate so we can understand um, the structure of our product. So whenever we talk about amino acids, we have that um, alpha carbon. The alpha carbon is going to have a carboxyl group. It's going to have a hydrogen. It's going to have that amino group. And it's going to have some sort of an R group. And in the case of aspartate, we have two carbons a carboxylate end with a CH2 in the middle. Now let's compare this to the structure of carbamoyl aspartate. Now in carbamoyl aspartate, this part is coming from the bicarbonate. This came from the glutamine. This pink part is coming from our aspartate. But specifically how? This carbon is forming a bond with the nitrogen on aspartate. Where is the nitrogen on this aspartate in green? This is the nitrogen right over here. So the carbon over here is going to form a bond with this nitrogen. That means our alpha carbon is right over here because our carboxyl group is right over here, which means the remaining two carbons are right here from aspartate. So it's important to orient ourselves properly when we talk about the binding of these molecules. Let me just get rid of this. We can move forward. All right, so we get this carbamoyl aspartate. Now, in the next step, we need to think about how do we close this ring structure because pyrimidines are closed ring structures. Well, we're, under, we're gonna undergo a dehydration. So we have this H+, and remember in the body, we do have free H+, uh, that is accessible for use. And what we're gonna see is that when it, we're gonna lose one of the uh, hydrogens over here on this nitrogen, and we're gonna lose one of the oxygens on that carboxyl end over there, and we're gonna form H2O. Now, since we've dehydrated it, there is the possibility to form a bond between uh, this carbon and this nitrogen. So we're gonna see a, a sigma bond formation between this nitrogen and this carbon. Now we've closed the ring. That's great, we're one step closer to our uh, final product of a pyrimidine. So this is called dihydroorotate. And we'll actually see that we're first gonna synthesize orotate before actually getting to our uracil. So in this next step, we can see that we have dihydroorotate, but we wanna get to orotate. Why do we wanna do that? We can see the difference between these two molecules is that there's this conjugation over here. We need to understand that <clears throat> bases, nitrogenous bases, have to be flat and conjugated in order for them to stack properly in DNA and RNA. And that's exactly the case of why we want that conjugation. So how do we form this conjugation? Well, we have to lose these two hydrogens. So these two carbons are going to lose those hydrogens via the enzyme, uh, via the enzyme dihydroorotate dehydrogenase. So this is going to be an oxida oxidation and reduction reaction where this molecule is getting oxidized and NAD plus is getting reduced. Remember, NAD plus is an electron carrier, so we release NADH and H plus and we get orotate with this conjugation over here. Now we get to the good stuff. Finally, we're at orotate. We're super close to getting to uracil. But before we get to uracil, we're actually going to take a activated sugar component and we're going to attach it to our orotate. But I want to take a moment and think about this sh sugar structure over here. If we got rid of this portion over here, of this sugar structure, what does this molecule look like? That molecule is found in another pathway. It's found in the pentose phosphate pathway. 
In the pentose phosphate pathway, the final product of the oxidative phase is ribose 5-phosphate. So this molecule right over here is ribose 5-phosphate. So we can actually see how all of these pathways within biochemistry interconnect with one another. So when we get this ribose 5-phosphate from the pentose phosphate pathway, we actually utilize ATP and we take two of the phosphates on ATP and we add them to the ribose 5-phosphate so we can see two phosphates added and we get this activated uh, sugar component known as PRPP. It has this longer name, but for short, we'll just say PRPP. Now, now that we understand where this molecule is coming from, um, we can actually piece the further parts together as well. So remember, whenever we add phosphates, they're, most of the time they're going to act as good leaving groups. Um, and in this case, it's true because when we remove these phosphate groups, we're going to end up with pyrophosphate. And whenever we see the release of pyrophosphate, almost always immediately we're going to see that the pyrophosphate is going to break into two individual phosphates and that releases a lot of energy, which can also drive this reaction forward even more. So when, when the reason why they're acting as a good leaving group and we're breaking this bond is because we want this carbon to form a bond with orotate. Because we should also think about why we're doing this. Remember that when we talk about a nucleotide, a nucleotide consists of a nitrogenous base, a sugar, and phosphates. So we're on our way to make a nucleotide. So we're going to see that this nitrogen is going to form a bond with this carbon over here, and we get orotitylate. And we see, see that release of pyrophosphate, and the enzyme was a transferase enzyme. And now we have a nucleotide. We have a nucleotide. We, we have this nitrogenous base, we have a sugar, and we it's a monophosphate. But we're not interested in orotitylate. Although it is a nucleotide, we're not interested in it. We're interested in uracil, cytosine, or um, thymine. So we're going to take that orotitylate and we're going to convert it into something we want, and we want uracil, so we're going to do that. How do we do that? Very straightforward, very simple. The only difference between orotitylate and uretylate uh, or uracil is that this one has this uh, carboxyl group and in uracil, we do not have a carboxyl group. So what are we going to do? We're going to decarboxylate via the enzyme decarboxylase. We can see we lose that CO2 group. That was very straightforward. So we went from having orotate. We're not interested in orotate as a nitrogenous base. We want uracil. All we did was decarboxylate. Now, once we decarboxylate, we end up with uridylate. If we look closely, uridylate is the same thing as saying UMP. Why is that? Because you have your uracil, you have your sugar, and you have a monophosphate. You have one phosphate. So this is UMP, or we can also call it or call it uridylate. Now, now we have the first thing we were interested, UMP. Now the next part is super straightforward. How do we get to UDP and UTP? We just add more, another phosphate. So in order to go from UMP or uridylate, uridylate, we just use an ATP. We transfer one of the phosphates on to our UMP, and now we have UDP. Super straightforward. The enzyme was UMP kinase. Now, if we want to go from UDP to UTP, we, well, we can just use another uh, energy equivalent. So in this case, I wrote YTP. The reason why I wrote YTP is that in this final step, we can actually use, uh, we can actually use UTP, we could use ATP, uh, we could use TTP, uh, so forth. So it, it doesn't matter in this case which specific nucleotide we use, as long as it's a TP, it's a triphosphate. So we take another triphosphate, <clears throat> we take that terminal phosphate on here, we attach it to the UDP, and now we have UTP. We have our uracil, we have our sugar, and we have our triphosphate and that 
is the de novo process for synthesizing a pyrimidine, specifically uracil. Now, let's overview what happened in the de novo pathway. Remember, there's two pathways we can use to synthesize pyrimidines, the de novo and the salvage. Here we went over the de novo. In the de novo pathway, we use a PRPP. Remember, that's our activated sugar molecule that... Uh, so remember, we get that ribose 1,5-phosphate from pentose phosphate pathway. We add two more phosphates from ATP. We get PRPP. We use amino acids. For example, we used glutamine and we used aspartate. So in the de novo pathway, we use PRPP. We use amino acids. We use carbon dioxide. Specifically, that was the bicarbonate. And we use ATP. And in the end, we end up with a nucleotide. And that is the de novo pathway for synthesizing pyrimidines, specifically UMP, UDP, and UTP.